Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'll be building the Star Wars Legion Bark Speeder from Fantasy Flight Games. While I don't play the Star Wars Legion tabletop game, I love their models. I've already built the AT-RT and the Occupier tank, and so I know that, that uh, they're good quality kits. This is what it, it is. It's a speeder bike with a sidecar and a laser gun. I mean, come on, how cool is that? Um, that would make going through traffic a whole lot easier, I think. The kit's pretty simple. It just consists of uh, a few parts for the, the speeder bike itself, and then a couple of figures. There's also some game tokens that come with it. If you play the game, you'll be familiar with that. And then there's a little base that it's going to be mounted on. So I'll be getting all of that together in this video, and uh, painting and weathering it, and see uh, how it ends up. The instructions that Fantasy Flight Games provides for their models are very clear. Uh, they give a, not only a visual description, but a text description. Now, I had the option of choosing which crewman to, uh, to model. I wanted the guy with the rocket launcher. I thought he looked pretty cool. The parts don't come on a sprue. They come in bags. So uh, I went through and looking at the instructions, just uh, parted them out to the various sub-assemblies that uh, were required. There is a little bit of cleanup that needs to be done. You can tell at one time they were on a sprue, so you'll need to clean up the nub marks and the seam lines and things like that uh, just to make sure that you get a good look for your model. Now, when you're gluing it together, it's like any other model. It's You can use standard glue. I'm using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, but whatever you use for your favorite glue, uh, for polystyrene will work just fine and I just apply that like I would on any other model and give it a little bit of a, a press and get it assembled and you can see uh, it assembles fairly quickly this this took me under an hour to do uh, to get this ready and here are the sub assemblies that I'm going to be breaking it down into uh, for painting uh, just to make that a little easier now you do need to make sure this swing arm can still move um, because that'll be important later on in the articulation of the model. The crew members also needed a little bit of cleanup, uh, just some seam lines along the legs and the sides, and I temporarily set him in place. Those those control handles are not glued in, but I wanted to be able to set the angle of his arms in relation to those so that it would fit correctly on the model later. So I got him in place in a dry fit and then glued the arms and the wrist together so that I could pull the driver off and just make that a little easier to mount up later. For the gunner, uh, the arms are separate pieces, the rocket arm, and so I wanted to make sure this arm, while glued to the model, was properly resting on the rocket launcher, so I glued it at the shoulder there. Now there's an option for a crewman that's firing this laser gun and I wanted the laser gun to be on it but the handles are part of his hands. So I just did a quick modification and glued those parts to the model and then clipped everything off so that I can have the gun sitting there without the hands attached to it. And uh, and that'll be on the sidecar and I thought it would just give it a cool look to uh, have that there also. The base is a typical round base for this game. If you set it in the center, the the positioning in my mind is a little odd. So what I did was I, I did a dry fit, and then I just found a place on it where the vehicle itself was more centered on the base. Then I held that in place, pulled the vehicle off, and just went in with some Tamiya Extra Thin Cement and just let the capillary action of that cement flow underneath the the little clear rod and after I put on a couple of applications of that, I just simply uh, pushed that down to make sure it had a good join right there with the uh, base. And with that done, everything was ready for priming and painting. And I had the parts broken down like I wanted to for that. Now, for the base painting, I decided to just do priming and painting in one. This is some Badger Steinel Res uh, 
primer, the white primer with just a little bit of neutral gray added to give it a little bit of a darker look. So it took, it took care of all of that in one step. And since everything is the same base color, it made it fairly easy to do. And you can see the breakdown of the, the crew there, how I've got that. Now the next step is going to be masking off for all of those red stripes. And the, the simplest way I can tell you I did this was I cut some small pieces of Tamiya tape and just went through and very carefully placed them on to get them as neat as I could. Uh, I could have I could have used curved tape, but I found that it was not working as well as this Tamiya tape did when cut into small strips. And you just have to kind of work through a bit at a time uh, using your thumb to hold it in place and then setting the angle and then working along and just keep repeating the process until you get all of the shapes and patterns done like you want. And then I masked off everything because I didn't want any of the color that's going to be sprayed next to, uh, to, to get onto the white areas. Now, I wanted to do some hairspray chipping, so I grabbed my old Aquanet and gave it a coat of hairspray and then I went back over it with the Tamiya flat red and it 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 gives it a really nice I love that color it's a really good red color and when I'm unmasking it I always pull the tape against itself and pull it off slow uh, you don't want to do it too fast or straight up because you can pull things up but you can see it just resulted in some nice white uh, and red contrasting lines, very sharp lines. And so the rest of it, I drank a couple of cups of coffee so I could go into super speed mode and, uh, and just begin unmasking the rest of the model. And you can see it turned out pretty good. Uh, it's kind of like Christmas, you know, you, you unmask and you're not sure if you're going to get a really cool Hot Wheels toy or a pair of socks. So in this case, uh, thankfully I was able to get uh, some really cool Hot Wheels models, and I didn't get any socks. The The overall look was really good. That one piece where there's some red overspray on that one little part, that's going to be covered up with uh, additional parts, so I didn't worry about that. But just pulling it off very carefully will give you a, a nice result and uh, good sharp lines if you burnished everything down well before you started. And I was really happy with how that looked. I thought it it uh, it captured the look of the box art. It wasn't perfectly precise, but I thought it was a pretty good look and definitely looks the part of the universe. Now for scratching, uh, for chipping, I just went in with a wet brush, and you can see that first that first chip, man, it just took off quite a bit, a little more than I intended. Uh, so I kind of backed off on the pressure in that area, but kept working around the rest of the model. And it's just a process of wetting the brush, wetting the surface of the model, cleaning your brush off, and continuing to chip. Some areas will come off real easy like that first one did, but most of this I really had to work at it. I had thinned the paint out with alcohol, and that made it a little easier to chip. And here you can see at the end, I just chipped off what I wanted, concentrated along the panel lines, and... Uh, ended up with a fairly heavily chipped look, which is really what I was going for. So I was very happy with with how that turned out. I went ahead and painted this black stripe around the, the figure's uh, helmet and painted in his eyes. But what I want to do, and also the uh, the straps there on his his body, but I also wanted to do something to kind of bring out all of the shapes and volumes and recesses and you know do do some shadowing uh, on on the model so what I'm going to use is a, a method that I saw and, and I don't remember which one did it or if I'm remembering a hybrid of the two but I've watched videos by Sarastro's painting and uh, on the Duncan Rhodes uh, Paint Academy channel about painting the the clone troopers and what I don't remember which one did it or if both of them did it this way or if I'm kind of remembering a mix of the two, but somehow out of watching them, I came up with, not came up with, but I'm going to emulate this method. They did a mix, or there was a mix of about three parts of this apothecary white contrast paint and one part black Templar. 
and then to that I'll add some technical uh, some of this contrast medium it's a technical paint from Citadel to to uh, thin it down it's basically a contrast paint without any ink is essentially what that is and I'm going to add just a drop of my little Liquitex uh, flow improver here and what I'll do as you'll see is just paint that over the whole model and then wick up the excess from the flat areas and then go back in and brighten those up but um, it looked like a pretty cool method and uh, and so it, but an easy method so I'm gonna go ahead and employ that all right I've got the mix here in my palette and uh, you can ignore this toothpick uh, it's doctor's orders so anyway <laughs> anyway so what I'm gonna do is just get this kind of big brush here and I'm simply gonna let me see where I can start where I can get it on camera the best we'll do the leg here and I'm simply gonna just paint this all over as I'm doing this I think my brain is remembering that it was Serastro that did it this way but again I may be wrong I watched both of their videos Serastro and Duncan Rhodes and found them to be both both very good and very helpful in planning how to paint these now, I'm not doing this real elegantly because I'm doing it from behind the camera, but what I do is I'll just go in and wick up some of this excess from the flat pieces of the armor like that before it dries. And that flow improver helps make cleaning that up a little easier. Now, when you see the brush going off camera, I'm just wiping it off, cleaning it off. I'm actually wiping it off on my shirt. Don't tell my wife. Shh. Actually, she knows. When I'm when I'm working, it's actually something I do when I'm working. I actually wear old T-shirts, and I just use them to wipe stuff off while I'm wearing it instead of having to always chase down a rag um, or a cloth or a paper towel or something. And uh, it's actually kind of handy. It's messy. Uh, you have to throw away the T-shirts after a while. Well, I probably should, but I don't. But... <laughs> Anyway, you see how I'm doing this. I'm just cleaning that up. But what it does is it gets all of the, the recesses shaded. And then it leaves a tint, just kind of a grayish tint to the whole thing. Now, I'm going to go in later after this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that. We're going we're gonna to layer that back up, or while well, I am, you're going to watch. And uh, although if you choose to do it this way, then you will too. But this is real easy because... You don't have to worry about being real precise um, in terms of getting this applied. You just want to get it on everywhere and then simply clean up some of the excess. And then I want to layer up over that to, to just take away some of that dinge. But I want to leave a little bit of it because it creates some shadow. Um, it creates a little bit of a a zenithal lighting effect, if you will, um, the way I'm going to be painting it. And it also just makes it look a little more used and worn and battered. Um, you know, uh, if, if you've ever had a white car, you know that a white car doesn't stay white very long. You have to wash it a lot. So I'm working on the same theory here with this armor. But let me go ahead and get the rest of it done, and then I'll move on to the next steps. Okay, I've got that on there, and I gave it a quick blast of the hair dryer, and you see that it's giving him some good shading. Now, he looks a little splotchy and grimy, you know, like he's been through the mud. So this is not the final state, although I suppose if you were going to, um, you know, if you were just looking to build up your army really quick, and, you know, we're looking for a, a weathered look, you could hit it with this contrast paint like this and put it on the table, and, you know, at a, at a distance, it just looks like a dirty dirty clone trooper who's uh, been rolling around in the mud a little bit so um, this could work but what I want to do next is I want to start bringing back up some of these flatter pieces of armor to uh, to a shade getting closer to pure white all right now I have a, a mix of three parts Col Vallejo cold white and one part Vallejo sky gray here and I've thinned it down uh, fairly good with with water and what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine the lights coming in like from the top and the front. And so I'm going to focus on the front areas to just build that white back up. Now I'll leave 
the areas that wouldn't face the light, I'll leave those with more of the, the mix of the contrast paint on it that I had just to uh, suggest some shadow. But on areas like this that are going to be facing the light, I'm just going to go in and build up, and I apologize that this is going out of focus, um, but I'm going to go in and just build up that color. I'm pulling the stroke towards the light so that that's where the most amount of paint is going to go is at the end of the stroke, so I'm counting on that. But I'll just go through and cover up that contrast paint that I put on there and it may take a couple of coats. I think my paint is just a little too thick. Let me thin it down with a little more water. When, when you're brush painting, just like with airbrushing, the, how thick or thin your paint is, is really critical to how successful you will be. Um, as I learn more of brush painting, I see that more and more. And I also find that the less paint I have on my brush, the better things go. But I'll just continue doing this over all of the armor pieces that are facing essentially from this view and, uh, and get those painted over with this mix and get them at a good opacity so you're not seeing any of that previous contrast paint. And then I'll move on to the next step in painting the armor. Okay, I've got that painted on there, and you can see that it's just brought that up. It's still looking a little bit dingy, but that's okay. Um, I think the poor lighting that I've, that I've got is making it look a little more dingy than it actually does as I'm looking at it in real life, I guess you'd say. Now, the next paint I'm going to use is Vallejo White. This is just pure white. There's been no nothing added to it to make it um, off-white. It it's pure white. And what I'm going to do here is just really go for the most upturned surfaces and edges and things like that because that's what I want to appear that it's catching the most light. And so it's just a process of getting that on there and blending it in a little bit and just simulating the highlights. I think the key to painting white is to not actually use very much white, but rather to have very light grays and then just in key areas add some pure white over it. And I think that sells white better than just painting something white and shading it because so much white on something like that it kind of blows the eye out. You know, if you've ever heard the term snow blind, you know, somebody can go out and there's so much light reflecting off the snow that if you're not careful, um, it can cause temporary blindness. Or at the very least, just really blow out your eyes, I guess you'd say. If you've ever been outside a lot in the sunlight, you'll know you'll come back in and it's difficult to see because there's, you know, there's, there's been so much light and your pupils have changed, uh, dilated, but or gotten smaller, whatever the term is. But anyway, um, by going in and just painting some of these areas pure white, but leaving the other areas a little dingy, it's going to sell white to the eye much better than just pure white. Or at least... For a guy who does videos on YouTube, it sounds good, so I'll stick with that. But let me keep doing this, and uh, I apologize if that's off camera, because I'm having to watch what I'm doing and not the camera. But let me keep doing this and, uh, and get those highlights built up, and we'll move on to the next step with painting the figure. All right, I've got that white built up, and I kind of like that. It's by no means perfect. Um, I'm no figure painter. But, and it still looks a little dingy around some of the edges and things like that. But, you know, this is viewing from three inches away. Uh, if, if you see it from a little further away, 
this is about six inches here, um, then I think it starts looking a little better. So, you know, my, my goal with figures, uh, given my inexperience with painting them, is if they look good at about a foot away, then I'm happy with it. So I can live with that. But what I did was I just focused on these most upturned areas, uh, prominent areas, the, the front of his face, the top of his helmet, that kind of thing, uh, just to try and get this this one piece of armor right here that, there on the chest that's very visible, um, the tops of his arms, tops of his legs. I just tried to build those up so that it it will sell the white, but then there will be shadow, and it gives hints of dirt and grime and, you know, having been out in the field and all of that. So uh, hopefully that, that works. All right, this is take two. <laughs> I won't bother going into it, but obviously I started painting some black onto uh, the, the figure. I'm using this black Templar, which is a contrast paint. Now the way a contrast paint works is it's it's fairly thin in that it will um, allow some of the base color to show through, but it will settle into the recesses. So it works both as a paint and as a shade at the same time. So I thought I'd use this for things like the gloves and um, some of the joints in the armor where I want a little deeper shadow in there. So I'm just going to go around and in a few places uh, put this Black Templar on to uh, to uh, get his gloves looking right and so just add some additional shadow in there. And uh, and that should finish off the, the white and the black portions of painting the figure. The box art shows the shoulder armor to be painted red. Now there's a white rim around it and I'm going to I'm going to try and paint that or not paint that, but I'm definitely going to have to do that off camera. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint it up to the top of the shoulder and then try and leave just a wide edge around it. For this, I'm using Citadel's uh, game color Gory Red. Well, I tried. Um, my hands shake quite a bit and... Uh, I tried to get that white edge around there by not painting it white or not painting it red. That didn't work. So I painted the whole thing red and then went back and tried to dry brush on some white to give an edge. But that just looked like an old fat guy with shaky hands trying to dry brush on some white paint. <laughs> and then I tried to paint in the white edge. But again, with my hands, um, it's not too bad usually. But just this morning, I'm just not able to get that like I wanted. So I finally decided, okay, this guy, it's just going to be red all around. And uh, there's not going to be any white edge because this guy just didn't have it that way. So <laughs> it is what it is. All right, now I'm just going to go in and I'm going to take some very thin red paint and I'm going to thin it down with water, get most of it off of the brush. And I'm just going to kind of add just some highlights be helpful if it was on camera add some highlights mainly up towards the top like that and I'm just going to kind of push the paint around until I get it like I want it and hopefully that'll just not make it look so monotone and give it a little bit of life okay the figures are pretty much completed so I want to do a few more things on the bike itself and one of them is, it's got this part here that I'm assuming to be some kind of engine or part or maybe even exhaust port or something going on. There's also one on here. And what I want to do is just stain them up a little bit. So to do this, I'm going to use a mix of Vallejo Chocolate Brown with just a touch of German Gray in it to darken it up and give it kind of an oily, grimy look. I'm just going to get some on the end of this this makeup brush here and I'm going to tamp off most of it on this paper towel and I'm going to use a stippling motion to just try and impart a greasy look around that like this and I want to get fully cover 
the grill itself, but then I also want to get just a little bit outside of that, especially as I move back along towards the, the back of the vehicle, just to make it look like something's happening there and uh, that there's some grease and grime collecting, maybe some kind of exhaust soot, just something going on right there. I could do this with oils, but doing this with acrylics will get, uh, this method will pretty much get the same result in terms of how it looks visually, but this will be dry in just a few minutes and I can continue going, whereas if I would have done this with oils, it would have not dried for, really dried for a couple of days. So let me get this on there and on the other part and we'll move on. Now the same color can be used to just suggest some griminess, some dirtiness, kind of start the, the environmental weathering and just by lightly dry brushing it on to uh, leading edges of, of uh, surfaces on the model. It just, it just kind of gives it a dingy look. You don't have to go too heavy because since the underlying paint is white it doesn't take a lot of pigment from the brush to just give just a little bit of a hint of staining. So this color works well to get that going. You can see I've done some right along there a little heavier where the rider would climb on and off. So don't overlook just using plain old acrylic paints and some simple dry brushing to add a little bit of weathering to your models. I want to add some some earth effects to the underside especially, just some splatters to suggest, you know, it's it's flying along at high speed above the ground and you know if it goes over a mud puddle or stirs up dust, there's going to be some kind of dusty dirt effect going on. So I'm going to mix um, about three parts of this desert dust wash from Vallejo and one part brown. I'm just going to add some water to it. I've got just a little bit of my palette off camera. And I'm going to use the splatter technique. And that's where you get some paint on your brush. You just load it up. And you start off off the model just to kind of see what pattern you're getting and to offload the bulk of the paint. And then you just kind of start splattering it on there. And uh, that pretty much is what it produces, splatters. And uh, you can then follow this up with additional streaking and larger staining and stuff like that. But if you just build this up, several layers of it, it will, it will give it a mud splattered look. And you can use more than one color, certainly. I'm probably just going to use this one. I may, I may mix it up just a little bit after I see how it looks when it dries. Generally this product goes on much more opaque than it actually dries. So you have to kind of gauge it as you're working with it to see how much, how much you know, more you need to add. Uh, I'll probably, once I get this initial round done, I'm just going to hit it with the hair dryer to dry it a little quicker. And, uh, and then I can evaluate, do I want to add more, do I want to change up the tones, how do I want to handle it going forward? But it's a good product to use for this purpose, and uh, and I make use of it quite often. All right, you can see the result of those mud splatters, and if you don't like the way that that looks, um, you could go with oils or enamels, and be able to blend those in a little more. I wanted it to look splattered like that. I like the way that looks, so I'm good with it. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take some Vallejo beige, 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 and I'm just going to dry brush this onto the underside because I want that to suggest dust. Um, you know, because not only is it going to get mud splattered up on it, but it's be, if it's if it's over dry ground, it's going to be swirling dust up and and uh, things like that. So I want to get some of that on there. And then also, because 
while the mud is going to splash up on the underside, on the faces, on the surfaces facing that, it would also make sense that dust would get up here on the top, especially around the lower edges. So I'm just going to go around and again using this beige, beige BG, um, I'm going to dry brush that on just to just to sell the notion of some dust effects. All right, I have everything painted and assembled and mostly weathered to my liking. What I want to do now is I'm just going to take a few minutes off, off camera so I can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to take a few minutes and get everything assembled and glued in place and then take a look at it as a whole. When I get towards the end of a project, regardless of how many sub-assemblies I've had or what steps I've taken to get there, there's always kind of a point where I look at it assembled and as a whole and see are there any of the steps that I go back and need to repeat so that if I need to put in any kind of panel lining or I think it needs some more dust or dirt effects or chipping or anything like that, I can see it all together and make those final adjustments before calling it done. So let me get started on that and I'll show you what the assembled model looks like uh, right after. All right, I've got everything together and I'm really happy with how, uh, how this model turned out. It's an easy model to build. There are really no vices to it, nothing very complicated about it. You could get this done in uh, maybe a long day of modeling or a, a weekend of modeling. If, if I hadn't been filming this, I probably would have just finished it up in, in a day. There's, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot to do in terms of enjoyment, um, but in terms of the actual time needed, it's not, not too much at all. Now, the, 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 in the photos, you'll notice that, that I have it on its stand. I did that off camera, uh, just, just doing some work over time and, and, uh, I'm not anyone that that you want as an example for basing your models. Um, it's not something I do a lot, so I just put that together. I actually uh, followed instructions from uh, some other uh, figure painting folks and just kind of took the cues from what they did and and copied that. So uh, I didn't feel like it was it was um, it just wasn't worth documenting my efforts because I just I essentially just slapped some glue onto uh, the base uh, and glued the rocks on then put the sand on uh, brush painted some primer over it so the paint would have something to stick to then painted it gave it a wash called it done and glued on a few tufts of grass called it done that was it so um, it's it's real simple uh, how, how to do that, but the trick is getting a really good look. So um, you, you probably want to look at, look elsewhere for for how to how to get a really good looking base. But anyway, this is a fun kit. I definitely recommend it. It's not something you're going to find in other Star Wars collections from other manufacturers. It's just it's I guess it's too much of an oddball vehicle for you know mass sales to take place. But in the gaming realm. It's perfect, so I really recommend this kit. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I am grateful that you've, especially if you're still hanging out um, at, at this point, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for the watch. Uh, please, if you have not already done so, hit the subscribe button, and there's also a little bell icon. I'd appreciate it if you click that. That'll just notify you when I have new videos available, and... Uh, and you can uh, hopefully follow me uh, on my future videos. There are links down below to the various social media platforms I'm on. If you're also on one of those, I would be grateful if you would connect with me there and uh, maybe let me know that you saw the videos. I'd be grateful for that. There's also a link to Patreon if you would like to support the work that I do. There's some options available to you. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for doing so. You make this possible. You truly do. And my family and I are so very grateful for it. And to close, I'll leave you with one final thought. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.